So in this section, we're going to continue our discussion of the transverse loading of a beam. And we talked about at the outset that transverse loading induces both a bending moment, which causes a bending stress, and a shear force, which we said causes a shear stress. We haven't discussed that yet, and that's going to be the focus of this lesson. The bending moment, as we learned in our previous lesson, directly relates to a normal stress within the beam. And for most beams, that normal stress is often the critical uh, criterion that describes the failure of that beam. So if you exceed the normal stress allowed for the material, the material is going to fail. But for certain beams, um, this is often true for uh, short and thicker beams, um, for short and thick beams, the shear stress becomes crucially important. And in these types of situations, uh, if that shear stress exceeds the uh, critical shear stress of the material, um, then failure can occur at that point. And so it's important for us to be able to identify and calculate both the normal stress from transverse loading and the shear stress that occurs from transverse loading. The most easiest way to think about this um, is either by grabbing a deck of cards or a, or a book. Um, and so what you can do if you take a book that's really, really thick, as you can see here, and you try to bend it, what you'll notice is that the pages this is really difficult probably to see as I do it here, um, but just grab one off the shelf and, and play for yourself. Uh, what you can see is that these pages are all sliding past each other here. And I've kind of drawn a schematic of what it looks like here. Um, so each, imagine each one of these things being a page in the book, and as you push down on it, these pages are sliding past each other. Um, this happens uh, as well if you kind of splay out a deck of cards. All those cards are, are shearing past each other. This doesn't develop any stress in the case of the book there because there's nothing sticking those pages together. Um, there's, no fric there's a little bit of friction maybe, but there's no glue, uh, there's no material adhesive that's connecting these things together, so they just slide past each other. In a real structural element, this doesn't happen, right? This thing bends in the similar way that we've seen cantilever beams bend up until this point. And so what that means is if, if these, each individual slice, and you can imagine these being really infinitesimally thin slices throughout the material, if these slices want to slide past each other from bending, but they can't, they're resisted, there's something that's resisting that sliding, that resistance is going to uh, lead to a force within the material. Um, because these sheets are trying to slide past each other, they're shearing past each other. And so that's where the shear force comes from, which is going to lead directly to a shear stress. So this is really crucial because um, in certain structures, if that, uh, that sliding generates a significant amount of stress, that can lead to failure. Um, common examples include uh, bonded joints. And so if there's uh, two pieces that are stuck together with a certain glue, uh, you're exceeding the shear stress of that glue. Uh, same thing would be true for, instead of uh, glued joints, um, bolted or nailed structures where instead of the whole interface being stuck together there are points within there where there's a nail or a bolt and now those are under sh uh, the horizontal shear that we're talking about and if that exceeds the, the shear uh, stress allowed for the nail you can see failure. Uh, this also occurs in natural materials if uh, certain planes within the material are weaker than others. Uh, this occurs with uh, certain types of wood. So how do we evaluate this? And So we'll start with the kind of the simplest uh, beam that we've been describing up until this point. So it's a simply supported beam loaded at the center by some force P. Um, the the cross-sectional area, this is a prismatic beam, so the cross-sectional area here, um, it's not rectangular, uh, it has uh, varying from the top to the bottom, and so its centroid is somewhere located uh, below uh, what looks like the center of the actual structure. So if we take a structure like this, and we're loading it with a force P, so this is a transversely loaded beam, we want to evaluate what's happening at our point C there. And so we can kind of zoom in to that point there. And so this is a cross section that's also in the uh, XY plane as well. And so what we have here is uh, what I've shaded in this cross section here in, in orange or yellow is the area of interest. This is an arbitrary area, so this you could take this at any point. We're just taking an arbitrary area at point C, so I'm going to draw that on here. 
We already noted that the centroid for this thing lies below the central axis, so the centroid is somewhere down here. So here's where our neutral axis would be, which I'm denoting NA. In this case, now, what we're interested in is identifying uh, the forces acting on this arbitrary area that we chose within our beam. So, in this structure, there's going to be a stress that's normal. And that stress is going to be really large at the top, and it's going to decrease down to zero at the neutral axis. Right, so this is a linearly varying normal stress that goes from a maximum at the distance C away from the neutral axis, goes to zero at the neutral axis, and then goes negative uh, at the bottom part of the beam. So uh, in this case here, what I'm going to do is identify this top part here as C, this uh, distance there as D, and so what we have here is a we can say that the force acting on this area, this side of the element here, that force is going to be equal to the stress at C times our area dA. And the same is true over here, so now it's the stress at D times dA. And so what we want to be able to do is look at the forces in the x direction. And what we said from here is that there's some force that's resisting uh, the ability for that plane to shear past it. And so if we think of this as kind of the plane or that little uh, piece of paper that's trying to shear past what's right below it, what we said is that's not allowed to happen because there's some force acting in this direction, which we'll call delta capital H, which is uh, a force that's resisting that shear. And so here's our free body diagram. And so now we can write down um, a equilibrium equations by taking the forces in the x direction, summing them, and setting that equal to zero. So if we do that, what we end up with is that delta x, which is positive, is going to be added to, uh, what we're going to do is integrate over the area to get the force in each of these, and so it'll be, let's see here, uh, sigma c minus sigma d or acting over the area element dA and that's all going to be equal to zero. And so hopefully you recall from uh, last lesson that our normal stress due to bending, which is, this is exactly what we're dealing with, is just simply equal to the moment times the distance away from the neutral axis over your second moment of area. There's a negative sign out front as well. So here's our, our, um, our equilibrium equation. And so what we can do is we can replace this here and rewrite it as delta H. And I'm going to move this onto the other side of the equation. I'm going to replace this. A uh, little algebra is going to switch some signs around. And so what we'll end up with is that MD minus mc over i. That can all be pulled outside the integral. And the integral that we're left with is integrating over y dA. And so now we can start to simplify things here, right? The first thing that hopefully should jump out at you is that the integral of y dA is simply equal to q. That's our first moment of area. The second thing we can notice is what's going on up here. What we have here is the difference between the moment at point D and the moment at point C. And so that can equal delta M. And that delta M if we think about this as acting over the element delta x, which is this element that we're looking at here, this is going to simply reduce to, we take dm, 
So the infinitesimal is small amount times dx. We can replace our MD minus MC uh, with this part of the equation here. What we want to recognize is that this term, this comes back from our differential relations that we learned in the previous lesson. This term here is equal to our shear force, V. All right, so now we can start to, to um, simplify this. And so we end up with delta x is going to be equal to V times Q over I times the differential uh, delta x. And so at this point here, we can, just, we can define a new variable. And the variable that we're going to define is going to be known as the shear force per unit length. So I'm going to write this up here. The shear, horizontal shear force this is a horizontal shear force per unit length will be denoted by a lowercase q and it's going to be defined to equal delta h over delta x. And so it's just going to simply be vq over i. And so you notice this is a force per unit length. And what we're after, what we set out for at the beginning of this lesson was to uh, identify the shear stress. Here's a shear force per unit length. If we were able to get this as a shear force per unit area, that's going to be our shear stress. And so the question is, what is the thickness we need to, or the, what is the length that we need to divide this equation by to get a shear stress? What we've said here is we've picked an arbitrary area. And that's what this denoted by uh, this color up here. And so that arbitrary area is going to dictate what the shear stress is at that point, so right here. So we want to know, kind of acting along this plane, now if we want to know what the shear stress is along that plane, what we're interested in, we're interested in the length from here to here. We'll call that lowercase t. This is a confusing term. This is one of the ways that people will get tripped up um, working on these transverse shear stress problems. Um, the, the first way people will get tripped up is dealing with Q, um, miscalculating Q. I is pretty straightforward, V is straightforward. Calculating Q is where is the first place where you can commonly go wrong. The second place where you can commonly go wrong is identifying T. And T is going to be the width of the area of interest. It's kind of a confusing term, but I want you to think back to this picture. We have some arbitrary area. We want to know what the width of that is where the shear is occurring. The shear is occurring between this plane here and some infinitesimal and some plane an infinitesimally small distance away down the y-axis. And so we want to know the width of that area. T can vary a lot. If this is instead of being a plane, if this was a, a bolt, T is going to be the, the diameter of that bolt. If this is a glued segment, it's going to be the, the diameter of that glued segment. And so it's really important to take time and carefully identify the width of the area that we're interested in for calculating these problems. That allows us to, to take this from a horizontal shear force per unit length into a transverse shear stress. And our transverse shear stress looks very similar. And it's going to be equal to VQ over IT. As you start to work through problems, you'll see that, that calculating this um, is a bit cumbersome, and it'll take you some time to make sure you get everything right. There are some nice simplifications, which I'll point out very quickly. Um, for two common structures, this can be simplified. If we consider a beam with a rectangular cross-section, our equation for our shear stress 
becomes, in the case of the xy direction, it's going to be 3 halves times the shear force over the cross-sectional area times 1 minus y squared over c squared. So y is your distance, so if here's your centroid, the y-axis, x-axis, y is your distance of here, so what's the area that we're interested in? Uh, some arbitrary height. Uh, y, comparing that to, to c, will tell you uh, what the shear stress is at each plane, uh, kind of along the vertical direction of this thing. So if y is equal to c, if we're at the outer surface of our rectangular beam, there's going to be no shear stress there. And that makes sense because there's nothing on top of it uh, shearing this rectangular plate. If y is equal to 0, so if we're down here, y is equal to 0, this term goes away, and we'll see that we're at our maximum shear stress. So when y equals 0, we get our maximum shear stress, which would be tau max equals 3 halves v over a. That's in the case of a rectangular cross-section. The other common case that people run into is in American standard S-beams or wide flange W-beams. And in this case, our maximum shear stress is simply equal to the shear force over the area of the web. And so if these are the flanges up top, the area of the web is the cross-sectional area of this portion. So if you don't have a rectangular cross-section or a uh, S or W beam, then you need to use the Drenel formula of the, t of the shear stress to calculate what your transverse shear is for a given point. A good exercise would be to start here for uh, each of these beams and see if you can derive these relationships, um, see if you can determine where they come from. It should be fairly straightforward, it'll be a, um, a, a, a simple calculation. So this is our transverse shear stress and the idea is we want to be able to determine what the maximum shear stress is within a structure and then be able to compare that to the maximum allowable shear stress before failure occurs. That'll tell us if the structure is going to do, fail due to shear, and then we can do the same calculation, calculate our normal stresses using the calculation we learned in our previous lesson, and determine if the structure is going to uh, fail due to exceeding the critical normal stress.